From New York Times Opinion, I'm Lulu Garcia Navarro, and this is First Person. Their names are now infamous. George Santos, Elizabeth Holmes, Sam Bankman Freed, the epic liars of our time. People who built not just houses of untruths, but whole villages. When I look back at the fantastical stories they told, it's hard to understand why anyone believed them. But a lot of people did. What should we make of that? Especially given that on the other end of the spectrum, there are whole categories of people, like asylum seekers, who aren't given the benefit of the doubt, who are viewed as suspect until proven otherwise. For Dina Nayeri, figuring out why we trust certain people more than others has been an obsession her whole life. Dina fled Iran when she was a child and came to the U.S. as a refugee. Now, in a new book, Who Gets Believed When the Truth Isn't Enough?, she explores what her own journey can tell us about what it takes to be believed in America and what is lost when you aren't. Today on First Person, Dina Nayeri on why we are so bad at telling the truth from lies. Dina, it seems like your own journey as a refugee really set you on this path to understanding who is believed and who isn't. So I want to start there. Can you tell me why you had to flee Iran as a child? Sure. Um, Well, I was born, I guess, right in the middle of the revolution in 1979 when the Islamic Republic came in. And um, my mother was very religious. She um, was very religious Muslim, very observant. And then when I was six, my mother converted to Christianity. We had a trip to London that we took to see my aunt get married. And during that very whirlwind trip, my mother decided to convert, to become a Christian. Hmm. She came, yeah. And she came back and she was um, very, very open with her Christianity. She had a medical practice. She was an OBGYN and she told all of her patients about her new faith. And, you know, she had all these women who were in different kinds of trouble. There were like poor women and abused women and, you know, women with a lot of vulnerability. And so she would constantly proselytize to them. And so very quickly she got into trouble got thrown in jail, and and then um, we had to escape the country. So when I was eight, we fled from Iran, and we went to the United Arab Emirates, um, where we kind of blew through a tourist visa, became undocumented, then um, applied to become refugees and were taken to Italy, where we were in a refugee camp in a little town called Mintana. In the book, you focus on how the asylum process tests believability. Mm -hmm. You know, I've covered refugee resettlement, and I know that it is an incredibly arduous process. And this process can be derailed at any point if you are found to be not credible. Mm -hmm. That's the actual language that they use. Do you remember your interview for resettlement in the U.S.? Can you take me back to that day? Yeah, you know, the memory is very, um, very foggy because we had so many different kinds of interviews during that time. Mm -hmm. But I do remember the one, this interview, um, myself, my brother and my mother were all in the room. And my mother was being questioned by a woman, by an asylum officer, and um, had already been explained to me that being a Christian convert in Iran was enough to qualify us for asylum. So the only question was, were we really Christians in Iran? Did this one woman believe that we had converted truly in our hearts? And my mother, of course, had converted, and she was truly a Christian, a very faithful one. And she knew the Bible backwards and forwards. She had this Bible that she had underlined, and um, she used a different color every year that she read through the entire thing. Um, and so, you know, she she knew her stuff. And then at one point, um, this woman turned to me and asked a very simple Bible question. Um, you know, it was one of the Bible stories, like Jonah or some such. And um, the answer came easy to me, but only later did I realize that it it mattered what the children said, because it showed to her whether or not my mother had actually Uh, educated her children in her new faith, which is a sign of whether or not you believe. How old were you? 
I was nine years old. Hmm. Yeah. But I think the real nervousness over it, um, the real, you know, worry came with the waiting for a letter that told us whether or not we had been accepted. And that time, I think, was excruciating. And it was particularly excruciating for my mom, I know, because, you know, it was her performance that really mattered. Do you remember getting the letter when you finally realized that you had passed the believability test? You know, um, in the refugee camp that we were, it was kind of, it was this makeshift camp that was kind of in the husk of an old hotel at the top of a hill. And we each had our own cubby where we got our mail. Hmm. And every time mail came, especially after a round of asylum interviews, everybody would gather around the cubbies and we would see who got their letter. And, you know, I remember the first person in our group of friends um, who got his was this Iranian soldier in his 20s. And he had this um, incredible scar from the war on his face. His Half his face was bleached white, and he had become a good friend of mine. Um, I played soccer with him. And, uh, you know, he got his letter first, and I remember him dropping to his knees and weeping. Um, and at some point, we got our letter, and my mother opened it with trembling hands, and a part of us just believed that this was absolutely a yes letter. And when it was... My mother, she was all tears and laughter and joy and hugs all around, people just throwing themselves into each other's arms. It kind of started off this obsession I have with open doors, you know, with gatekeepers and being let into places and people saying, Dina, will take you. Um, that was the first one. That was the first kind of powerful stranger who said, we're good enough. So you get asylum and you were resettled in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about what happened when you walked through that open door and got to America. And I want to start with your mother. She had been, as you mentioned, an OBGYN in Iran, mm -hmm. someone who people looked up to. Mm -hmm. What did she wind up doing in the U.S.? Well, she at first worked in a factory. Um, you know, she was doing a kind of rote work that um, very, very, very low paid, exhausting, long hours. And one thing I should say is my family, we're, we're kind of all about academic credentials and things like that. And my mother, you know, she went to the best university. She went to Tehran University and she had a thriving practice and she was a doctor, a really good one. And... Um, you know, when someone was sick and she would offer a diagnosis in Iran, people would have sat up and people would have said, oh, you know, tell me more, doctor. And then we arrived in Oklahoma where everybody was, I guess, looking down on us. Um, you know, my mother was no longer looked at in this way with such respect and reverence. And I judged my mother very harshly for not being able to shed her Iranian culture faster. I was constantly on top of her, you know, mom, why? Why did you do that? Americans don't do this. Like, Americans don't say these deferential things. Americans don't insist on something three times. They take the first no as a no. You know, all of these Iranian cultural politeness things do not apply here. Just drop them. But of course, she had been raised in that culture and she behaved as she behaved. But I started, I guess, to really become obsessed with the idea that there is a particular way of behaving American, but also a particular way of behaving like um, a respectable, successful American. Can you tell me a story about a moment when you saw the change in her stature? Yeah, I mean, there were a couple of key moments. So one of them was when I was a teenager, I once went and visited her in her place of work. And um, I kind of got to watch from afar as she um, did something with her hands. It was some kind of vial filling or something, you know, kind of in a, in a factory-like setting. And I remember watching as this man spoke to her in a way that I've never seen or I never saw in Iran my mother spoken to. Um and she was deferential, as she had to be. And I remember feeling this hot shame and anger on behalf of my mother, because in this setting, she was kind of just being waved off and dismissed by this man. 
And as you were looking at your mother's experience in the U.S. and watching her lose credibility, how did that impact what you sought for yourself in America? You know, it's funny, you're asking me these things that I'm most embarrassed about now, but I wanted to be a powerful woman. You know, I wanted to be... Um, no shame in that. No. <laughs> I um, But, you know, I had this you know, vision of myself in a power suit in New York City, uh, you know, at some big firm. You know, I would be a lawyer. I had read, I think as a, as a kid, I, I, I read that international corporate lawyers are the most respected. I kept telling anyone who would ask, I'm going to be an international corporate lawyer. I didn't even know what that meant. <laughs> I just knew it was someone who um, got a lot of respect and a lot of money. And I just wanted to be the kind of women you see in movies that um, walk into a room and they say something and everyone takes it as fact. And that's who I wanted to be. I didn't, I didn't see my mother as that. When did you figure out that there were places that could maybe confer that on you? So at about this time, um, when I was becoming aware of... Well, I was very aware from the very beginning um, that our, you know, Middle Eastern background made us something, you know, suspicious, I guess, because the war with Iraq was going on. People often confused Iran and Iraq. Uh, you know, I got a lot of name calling in school about being from the Middle East, um, a lot of really very ugly racist names. And around this time, um, we met a man who was a pastor in Oklahoma City, kind of far away from our community. But... The reason that we met him is that my mom and stepfather, you know, I think they also kind of craved more people of color. And this man was a pastor in um, a black church, and he had so much gravitas. I mean, I don't know how to describe him. He had power in his voice. He could sing. The way he preached was just booming and elegant and beautiful and well-researched. And very, very quickly, I realized um, that he had gone to Harvard Divinity School. And I, I guess, latched onto that Harvard. This place has conferred upon him power and gravitas. And so I have to go to this place and get that. Because another thing that I saw is that despite his race, people respected him. People looked up to him. They asked for his opinion in the way that, you know, I guess I hadn't seen happen to Iranian adults since I was in Iran. Um, and so I latched onto that. And suddenly it was Harvard. This was the answer. So Harvard was your answer to ensuring credibility. Absolutely. I thought, once I have that stamp, who's going to question me? In the book, you talk about your time at Harvard. Yeah. And I want to jump to that period. You don't get into Harvard for undergrad, but you do go for a master's at their business school. Yes. Um, I think still with that little girl idea, maybe, of the power suit. Um, it, it kind of came true. Can you tell me about your time at Harvard? Did it match with your expectations once you reached this place that held so much power in your imagination? Sure. But I mean, there's one step in between, if you don't mind me. Um, so my first entry into this world, I guess, was more Princeton, you know. Um, I was an immigrant kid. Um, and I think very quickly it became clear that even though I was here, um, there were different I guess, classes of people in this university. You know, there were my classmates who were there and, you know, they had such ease. They lived there with such ease, not just financial ease, but like they were comfortable in that setting. Um, there was a summer job that I did after my freshman and my sophomore year where I would go around with another student and we would fundraise for an organization within the university from the alumni of the university. And we would sit and we would give them a little pitch and they would donate money. And for me, it was such an education because the person I was paired with um, would sink into another persona as soon as we got into that office. They would sit up and be poised. They would comment on things around the office. They would treat that person like their best friend. They would kind of sink into another kind of language. And I started to, to understand that um, we were playing a part, I, I guess, in front of these alums. And I started to understand about the idea that, like, we were performing our potential. Um, I couldn't be there asking for money, you know, with any kind of need on display. We had to be just all about how fantastic we were and how much we had to offer and how much this organization was doing for the university and so on and so forth. And so that, for me, 
kind of cemented that summer, this notion that you have to go around and perform, you know, your potential. And yeah, and I think that a couple of years later, when I was in business school, um, we learned, of course, a lot of very concrete things. But I think at the end of the day, the thing that I was learning every single day is how to, you know, how to speak in in a particular kind of language that people don't question, people trust, it makes them comfortable, hmm. you know. Um, so you hoped that Harvard was going to confer an earned credibility, but what you found was that it was teaching you that you can, what, fake it till you make it? I think the way that people presented themselves, and this is not something that was overtly taught there, but I think that looking around at my classmates, um, they... Um, they were very, very good at presenting themselves. They were very good at hiding their flaws and hiding their need and to just presenting a part of themselves that shines. And I think that ability to trigger or kind of turn on other people's imagination um, to your potential was their greatest asset. And I think we learned how to hone that. Once you graduated from Harvard, did you notice that it changed how people treated you? And how you walked in the world to have that stamp of approval next to your name? Well, I um, I think the way I behaved changed. You know, it's not as if I walked around with Harvard Business School, you know, on my on on my chest. Um, <laughs> but I think I did behave differently. Although I do notice that people who've been to Harvard always drop it within five <laughs> minutes of talking to them. They, anyway, they do, carry don't on. they? They do. <laughs> they do. And you know they what? Do. I've been guilty of that. Um, so yeah, I, I I tried not to drop that name too much, um, but I think I did carry myself differently. And um, I think that I was just around this particular kind of people and I I, I learned to behave like them in a way that was kind of calmer, more assured. You know, I learned all the little things that people, you know, learn in those circles. You know, how do you talk to a client? How do you present yourself as older? How do you present yourself as more of an expert in a situation where you're maybe baffled? Um, I don't know, how do you order a table wine? How do you, all those little things. Tiny everyday judgments of your class and your background and, you know, how much education and money you have and all of these things. And I think after Harvard, it was the first time I felt like I could really breathe because I didn't have to worry about those things because I pretty much understood um, what those things were, but also what to do if I fall afoul of one of the rules. You know, you you laugh it off, you're confident and breezy. and 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 I think that for me was, you know, a moment of relief. Um, but I remember a day when McKinsey, which is the company I had worked for before I went to business school, started calling and kind of saying, well, it's time for you to come back um, because I had a loan from them. Um, I, I cried. You know, I got that voicemail, which I think a lot of people would be excited about. But I thought, oh, my God, I don't want to go back to the business world. I don't want to go back to corporate America. You know, the image of this powerful woman that I had imagined since childhood in her black power suit. God, I didn't want it anymore because everything I had learned in corporate America and these corporate settings was about putting on a mask that isn't me. You've spent your life as an asylum seeker studying from the inside how to access credibility, almost like a detective in your own life. Mm -hmm. And after you've gotten to the mountaintop, you stop being interested in business. You don't go back to your big fancy job at McKinsey mm -hmm. and you become a writer and you step into the role of an observer watching other people go through this asylum process. Can you tell me about what you saw about who gets believed and who doesn't when you started looking into it from the observer standpoint? Yeah. 
So I, I actually went back um, to refugee camps for the first time after decades and, and you know, talked to people and, and sat down with them and had tea and listened to their stories. And as I started gathering more and more stories, I started to understand that one of the biggest obstacles was this getting believed, you know, that, that moment in the asylum office, which I had also lived through, but had seemed so, I guess, easy at the time. But um all the stories, there was one that was such a big and unwieldy and strange story, but I became obsessed with it. It was a story of a man called KV. And KV had um, left Sri Lanka in 2011. And he had been, you know, back in Sri Lanka, had been detained and tortured. And he had all of these scars across his back. And, you know, at the time, it was very well known by lots of human rights organizations um, that Sri Lanka had this particular method of torture that they used very, very often, which was hot soldering irons to the back and to the arms. And so there were a lot of people who would come through asylum offices in the West with these exact same scars, just again and again, these same scars to the back. And KV showed up in the UK with these very typical scars. Judgment in the matter of KV Sri Lanka versus Secretary of State for the Home Department. Um, now, the problem here is that the asylum officers had gotten desensitized and they started to believe that they were being lied to, which, of course, is completely illogical because if something is happening en masse, it's, if it's happening a lot, well, the same story again and again should actually confirm that it's true. Um, and not to mention the fact that the signs were right there on the body. The basis of his claim is that he is of Tamil ethnicity, and that in Sri Lanka, he had given assistance to the Tamil Tigers, then an insurgent political movement there, as a result of which he had been interned and tortured by government forces. But um, around that time, I guess, they began to make up this other bucket of disbelief. So they created a, a category called self-infliction by proxy, wherein they said that it's possible that you, the asylum seeker, put those scars on your own body on purpose, purely for the purpose of gaining UK asylum. The tribunal found his account to be generally unconvincing. In particular, it didn't accept that the scars were the result of torture. Now, the doctors, psychiatrists and things said, this is not something that humans do. It's not human behavior. Why would someone do this to themselves? And especially when we know that it actually happens that people are tortured this way. Um, well, they said, we don't have to really prove it, do we? We just have to show it as a possibility and say that we don't find this person credible and that we think this other thing might have happened. And they rejected KV on that, and his case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Today, we unanimously allow KV's appeal and direct the tribunal to reconsider the appeal which he made to it. What did you come to understand about the significance of what happened to KV? Well, I mean, for one thing, um, it, it became very clear that, you know, we tend to believe what we want to believe. If at some point the germ of an idea comes into our head that we are being lied to, we will find a way to show that we're being lied to. Um, it also, I think, really shows, you know, what... Um, how we grapple with things like familiarity. I think it was very, very hard for these asylum officers to just turn on their imagination and try to put themselves in KV's place, being tortured. And so when they started to hear the story again and again, I mean, it didn't, it didn't really cement itself as something um, plausible, tangible, and familiar that they could accept. It just became rote. So that's the view from the gatekeepers. Yeah. But you also write about how often the most vulnerable aren't the best tellers of their own story. No, no, they're not. And I think that that has to do with both culture and trauma. It has to do with shame. Uh, the officer can just say, I just don't believe this person is truthful. And they can do that based on one contradiction in, you know, a, 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 a stupid, you know, inconsequential, irrelevant contradiction. But as long as it's there, they can use that to say that you're a liar. You know, people will come in and they will 
suppress parts of their story simply because they're embarrassed. You know, if, if you're a man who was raped by another man, you're not going to just maybe own up to that so quickly. And 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 then if you're traumatized, your memory, um, the way you've stored that memory is not helpful because you lose a lot of contextual information in, in you know, memory making during trauma and you kind of keep all the the sensory um, information. And the sensory information isn't that helpful in an asylum interview. They want context. And so sometimes you just don't have the answers that they want. So you're saying that those who might most need to be believed are often the least likely to be believed because they are victims or vulnerable. Not just because they're victims or vulnerable, but because, you know, they're the the least... um, familiar to Western audiences. So one of the asylum officers that I spoke to said, you know, the people with the most money, the people with the most English, the most Western education, they just seem closer to our kind of people. They seem more familiar to us. So, you know, if we're relying on individual judgment, on the judgment of a judge or, you know, a border guard or an asylum officer, they're going to choose the people who are more Western seeming, more educated, less traumatized. And the people I just described are the ones that need at least, because what about a person who is, you know, has no education from a village in Iran who's just been, you know, tortured and they just come with no papers because they ran and um, a story that they can't present in the best way and with their need on display and their potential completely hidden what hope does that person have against our codes of believability and um, you know, trustworthiness? You know, these officers have to make choices all the time. I mean, last year, the U.S. Customs and Border Protection reported a record number of border encounters of more than 2 million. Yeah. And the amount of asylum cases has doubled. So there has to be a sorting, right? And so skepticism can be a guardrail, can't it? Well, you know, I think um, the asylum system is about whether or not your life is in danger. So so I think, sure, you know, there should be a sorting. But I think that the way that we're training the asylum officers and incentivizing them does not allow us to do a humanitarian job in that respect. Because what they're doing now is just looking for any discrepancy to dismiss when, you know, real life stories are full of discrepancies. A simple little discrepancy does not mean that that person is lying. I guess, you know, this is why asylum is such an interesting encapsulation of how we believe in general. You know, when we listen to strangers in all kinds of different contexts, we are kind of looking to protect ourselves, looking to confirm our fears, looking for any discrepant thing that we can dismiss. And the asylum system is such an interesting representation of that because they are overtly doing that. The system is built in such a way that asylum officers that I have interviewed have said, like, yeah, that's our job. It's our job to dismiss. It's our job to find a reason to dismiss. And it, it, it's it's kind of become very representative of how we make decisions when we're looking at stories from a place of fear, not looking to listen, um, not looking to understand. And I, I think it, it, it kind of plays to the worst part of us. I want to step back for a moment and bring up something that is in the news, George Santos, you know, the freshman Republican congressman in New York who lied about sort of huge swaths of his bio. And interestingly, as part of those lies, he cloaked himself in victimhood. Mm -hmm. He said his mother was working in the South Tower of the World Trade Center on 9-11. He said his family fled the Holocaust. None of it was true. Mm -hmm. Why do you think we would believe someone like him over someone, let's say, that I've met seeking asylum on the border who was actually a victim of tragedy and violence? This story is so infuriating because of the kind of stories that he's appropriated. Um, Yeah, so I think that the reason that he was believed is a couple of things. First of all, I think to some extent, it's not so much that we believed him. It's, again, a problem in the system. Because if you remember, he was an uncontested throwaway candidate in 2020, right? He was the Republican candidate in, you know, a district that was going to be won by a Democrat. 
right? So people didn't think it was worth spending the time to vet him and to research, you know, um, and to do kind of opposition research. Why would you do opposition research if you're definitely going to win? So he got onto the ballot for 2020 and there right there was a stamp. It was a piece of credibility. And next thing you know, he's on the ballot in 2022 and suddenly he's someone who is a serious candidate and it's too late, you know? So I think a lot of what happens with these charlatans is that they get past the early vetters, you know, the the early confers of, you know, like credibility, the, the people who say, check, this person passes the test. And the same thing happened with Elizabeth Holmes, right? I mean, for her, it was just about those early investors. The early investors were trusted and savvy, and they should have done the due diligence, everyone thought. And so um, their judgment was just basically trusted. And after that, people just didn't check this out. Hmm. So you've given two really powerful examples, George Santos and Elizabeth Holmes, who founded Theranos. I'm actually also wondering what you think about the kind of personas that they inhabited to get past these gatekeepers. Elizabeth Holmes and her black suits Mm. and you know, George Santos and his preppy outfits, all these (laughs) signifiers that you had learned about in your education, how should we understand how we react to them? You know, what's interesting is I think I make more sense of them using my writing education. Um, They put a particular image in our heads, you know, and I think that that's what good storytellers do. They put images in your head. So Elizabeth Holmes, you know, was putting the Steve Jobs image in our heads with her black outfits. And um, George Santos, I mean, he was putting kind of the image of this, I guess, a, a mysterious kind of South American financier. And um, he was also giving people, giving the Republicans exactly what they wanted. And the things that we believe always start off with like the things that we want to believe. That is the the germ of our beliefs is always what do we want and need to believe. Um, and the Republicans, I think, very much wanted someone who kind of ticked these identity boxes. Here's someone who's an openly gay Latino man um, who, you know, thinks the way that they do, you know, great. Um, So they wanted so much to believe in someone like him, exactly the way the investors wanted to believe so much in someone like Elizabeth Holmes. And I think that really takes you very, very far. So this is about performance matters more than truth in some way. Well, I think almost every story that we listen to Um, we are not listening for the truth. We're listening for a familiar performance. And I think the reason is because we can, you know, pinpoint a familiar performance, whereas there's no way we can pinpoint the truth. We don't have a radar for the truth. We weren't there with those people when they lived their stories. And you, you know, you know, that there's a lot of people who claim to be professionals in, uh, you know, spotting liars. Most of that has been debunked. There isn't really any kind of a science in trying to figure out whether someone's lying because, you know, truth and lies is in people's, you know, performance of truth and lies are determined so much by everything, culture, trauma, shame, everything we talked about. So the only thing we can look for is uh, the familiar performance. How do you understand situations differently now when you need to be believed, having thought so much about this? I think... I, I've become a cynic, you know. I, uh, I'm i different in front of doctors than I used to be. I definitely understand how to perform my pain in front of a doctor as a woman. Um, I understand what to say to lawyers. But on a day-to-day basis, um, I think one of the ways that this has affected me is that I have to remind myself to believe other people, you know, not to be so cynical and not to judge them so quickly based on my own shortcuts. Because, you know, just because I've read so much about this and thought so much about this does not mean that I don't have shortcuts. So, for example, recently I met um, a man who had immigrated from Iran through a lot of hardship a um, couple of years ago, and he was working for a charity that I support. And I was speaking with him because he needed, he wanted to kind of find a way that I could help the charity. And 
he started telling his story and he started to talk about his job. And the way that he was presenting himself was so completely out of line with the job that he had to perform. I mean, he was really pushing hard on all of his credentials, all the things that he had done when, you know, he should have been more relaxed into that position. I mean, he was just kind of going on and on in this kind of protesting too much way. His performance was not measuring up to what I thought a Western fundraiser should be. And so suddenly all of my triggers got going. And, um, you know, after a while, I stopped and I thought about that interaction. And I thought, wow, gosh, after all of this, I'm still completely governed um, by my fears and by my traumas and by my own biases. Um, and so for me, what that cemented is the idea that um, when we approach someone, we already have in our minds what we think that they should give us and how they should behave. Um, I suppose this is why nobody believed, I guess, my mom in Oklahoma when she tried to give diagnoses, right? Because they didn't expect this woman from Iran to be giving diagnoses. They weren't looking at her from the point of view of, you know, a doctor or as a doctor. They were looking at her as a refugee woman. And so that performance that she was giving was wrong. It's not what they wanted. It wasn't familiar. And so they rejected it. Dina, thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. First Person is a production of New York Times Opinion. Tell us what you thought of this episode. Our email is firstperson at nytimes.com. You can also leave us a review or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. This episode was produced by Sophia Alvarez Boyd with help from Derek Arthur. It was edited by Stephanie Joyce and Kari Pitkin. Mixing by Pat McCusker. Original music by Isaac Jones, Pat McCusker, and Carol Sabaro. Fact-checking by Mary Marge Locker. The rest of the first-person team includes Annabelle Bacon, Olivia Natt, Rhiannon Corby, Wyatt Orm, and Jillian Weinberger. Special thanks to Christina Samuluski, Shannon Busta, Allison Benedict, Annie Rose Strasser, and Katie Kingsbury. <laughs>